part of that. Also, there are encounter registration forms out in the, in the foyer. We certainly, certainly encourage you, if you have not experienced an encounter yet, to, uh, uh, to plan on, on coming. It's April 27th and 28th. Um, yesterday, one of our gentlemen lost his home to a fire. Howard Willis, uh, while he was here working at Upward uh, yesterday, uh, fire, the flames were, were taking apart his house piece by piece. Now, it is going to be salvageable, my understanding is. We're going to be able to rebuild it. But for right now, um, it cannot be lived in. And so, thankfully, Howard had good insurance or has good insurance. Uh, and a lot of those, some of those things are going to be taken care of. But um, we, want to, we want to help Howard. Uh, he does have some immediate needs, financial needs, and so we want to do uh, what we can. So here's what we're going to do this morning. At the close of the service, when the ushers come to receive uh, the connection cards while we're singing the last song, we are also going to be receiving a free will offering for Howard. It's separate from our tithes and offerings, so we're just going to be, you know, just whatever you might have in your pocket, or if you want to make out a check, uh, make it out to Howard Willis. We're not even going to run it through the church uh, books or whatever. Just make it out to Howard Willis uh, for however much you feel that the Lord would have you do. And we'll just give it to Howard and help him to get through the next, uh, the next few days. Um, I have never been through a fire. Uh, perhaps some of you have. If you have, you know how devastating it is and just how, how uh, it really shatters your world. So uh, anyway, we want to do that to help uh, Howard. Um, just, again, whatever you have, it will be at the end of the service. And uh, Nick, maybe uh, sometime, you, you're not busy enough, um, maybe you could, you could whip out a slide that's, that has Howard's name on it, just to flash it up at the very end, Howard Willis. And uh, so that they'll, people will know who to make the check out to. Thank you for being here this morning. We do have a, a short greeting from uh, Michelle Emick, who is in uh, Romania. She's going to be moving from there, so I'm not sure what her connections are going to be over the next uh, several weeks, but we do have a couple of minutes that she wants to greet us and talk to us this morning. And then, uh, Seth, it's all yours. Hi, Rock Island First. It's me again. Um, and if you can't tell by the sound of my voice, I have a slight cold that I developed last night. But other than that, all is well here in Romania. Um just to give you a brief idea of what I've done um, this past week, um, every weekday we've prayed at the church from 10 to noon, um, and that's just really been a blessing, being able to pray with the missionaries that help out at Hope Church. Um, and I've also helped out at their after-school program, and um, there's just this one little girl named Georgiana. Um, I believe she's 10 years old, and she's the sweetest thing ever. Um and although I can't speak Romanian and she doesn't speak English, we can still, like, communicate through charades and stuff. And um, it's her story is unfortunate just because both her parents are divorced and um, her parents don't take care of her and her grandmother has almost sent her to an orphanage. But um, all I can do is just love on her. And um, one of the days when I showed up at the school, even though it wasn't my day, she saw me and she yelled, Michelle, and she just ran up and hugged me. Um, so that's been probably one of my favorite moments here. Um, another thing that was really cool was when we went to um, a neighboring village called Cotiana, and we just played with kids, and they are just so eager to um, have people play with them. And, and we sung a few songs and reenacted the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It was quite funny. Um, Maybe slightly off, the, really, how the story goes, but I think they got the main point, so that's all that matters. Um, and then we also went to the homes of the two Christians in that community and just just got to pray with them and encourage them, um, given that um, they're often ridiculed or mocked because they are um, evangelical Christians. So that was another highlight. Um, but, yep, yeah, just wanted to share two different um, really fun stuff or fun things that I've been able to experience here. Um, and once again, thank you so much for your continued support 
Um, it really does mean the world to me. And I love and miss you guys a lot. That's it. Bye. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember. Lift that up, Lord of all the earth. Sing it out. 
to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. And at the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. You count the stars and you call them by name. Through the skies proclaim, God, you reign. Your glory shines. 
Father in heaven today, we give you our love and our praise and our thanksgiving. We give you honor and blessing. 
We give you glory. We give you our hearts. And we love you and we honor you and we thank you today for being our God and our Father. We come to you this day with hearts <clears throat> that are filled with love and gratitude because of your great grace and your goodness to us. We also come today, well, Lord, with, with needs that are in our lives. And Lord, we thank you today that you call our name. You know our name. Sometimes we are frustrated when we go into a crowd of people and and uh, perhaps uh, have seen them many different times, but <clears throat> for whatever reason, uh, we just cannot call their name. Lord, you are not like that. You know our name. You know our needs. You know our heart. You know everything that comes to us. And as Jesus reminded us, as Jesus reminded us, you know, the very hairs of our head. You know us that well. You know our motives. You know our desires. You know our heart cries. And Lord, you know when we suffer. We know when our, you know when our heart aches. And we thank you, Lord, for knowing us so intimately, even more intimately than we know ourselves. And we praise you and thank you today. Lord, we come to you this morning with those of our church family that, that have needs today. Lord, we, we cannot help but pray for Howard. And Lord, we, we just, to the best of our ability, we sorrow and we, and we, and we uh, grieve with him over the loss of his life, in his life, of his home. And Lord, we just pray today that you would bring resources across his path and into his life that will result in praise and honor and glory given, being given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray today that you would, just, uh, that you would establish him in, 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 in your love, in your grace, in your faith, even this very moment. Lord, we pray for those of our congregation that are sick, a number of our, of our children and, and, uh, and adults uh, have uh, things that are are afflicting them and Lord we pray for your healing upon their bodies and your strength and your uh, wellness to be part of their lives again Lord we pray for those that are undergoing various kinds of, of uh, procedures and treatments and all of the things that accompany that and all of the side effects all of the stuff and we just pray God today that you truly would be a father to us and to them Lord, that you would walk through them through these difficult times with your strong hand, with your mighty arm. Your arm is not too short to bring salvation to your people. Lord, we come to you with the needs of a, of a lost and dying world. Lord, and as we continue to progress uh, in our hearts and our minds through this season of Lent and as we as we begin to approach the cross here in the next uh, several days, we just ask God that, that the Spirit of God would witness with our spirit of the great love and the great sacrifice and the great longing that you have for us. Lord, if we are not in a place to receive your love today, oh God, help us, move us into that place, into that spot. But Lord, not only us, but a lost and dying world. Lord, we have family and we have friends and we have neighbors that, that need to know about Jesus. They have already seen you at work in our lives. They already know, Lord, the testimony that's in our hearts. But, Father, we pray that you'd help us to be able to move somehow even beyond that and to show them your goodness and your grace and to tell them of the love of Jesus. Lord, help us to get beyond ourselves. Help us to be beyond those things that would, that would hold us back. Lord, we bless and honor you today. Again, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for <clears throat> watching over us and protecting us, even when we are unaware of the danger that we are in. 
And Lord, for all of those things, we give you praise and we, again, have brought today our tithes and our offerings that we might give them unto you as an expression of our love and our commitment. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. very much. Throughout uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, weeks leading up to our encounter, we're going to be hearing from uh, folks that have experienced um, an encounter in their lives, and I, we, it's, it's, part of it is just to encourage you to be a part of uh, this next one, if at all possible. Sometimes it seems like there's a, there's a little bit of a hill that we have to climb in order to, uh, in order to participate in an encounter. I don't know what it is, if it's discouragement if it's scared or whatever but we've had over 80 people in our congregation go through an encounter and uh, it has done nothing but grace brought nothing but grace and good to our lives and so we're going to have another testimony this morning and A.J. Howe is going to talk to us a little bit about what God has done in his life. Good morning everyone how's everyone doing so far good? Awesome I'm glad to hear that. Um, as we all know, it does incredible things, and everyone's talked about it. I mean, you all have gone through an encounter before, uh, and, and a lot of you have helped out in some capacity or another. Um, but there's there's no real way to say what it has actually done. Uh, I've dabbled with religion a couple times in my life, and then finally when I, when I met the, uh, my church family, uh, I said, well, maybe it's time to go check this encounter thing out because everyone's go to the encounter, it'll fix everything, no more problems ever again, and, uh, and I, it's, it's, it sounded like it was the end all, fix everything, uh, and I went, and I was very apprehensive, oh, it's good, we're going to be sitting in classroom all day long, and what about the kids, and what are we going to do, but it was, it didn't take about an hour to realize that this encounter was built for me, there was, there was 50, 10 or other people in the class or so, they didn't matter. It was between me and God, and it was meant for me that day. Uh, and that experience put me on the right path that I wanted to be, to have an open heart, because I've been, I've been kicking God out of my life. I didn't realize that I was seeing God every single day uh, growing up uh, in, my, in my youth at work uh, at the grocery store, and I didn't realize what it was. And, and once I finally realized the signs that it was giving me, Look out, here I go. Remember that the southern gentleman that came up here and talked? Uh, Storm in the gates of hell with a water pistol. You know, and I love that. So I've been using that a lot. So once again, you've all gone through, an, uh, a lot of you have gone through an encounter. A lot of you help out, and we thank you for your help on that. But if you haven't done this, now is the time. Uh, it's, I can't say anything else about it. It's incredible. And there's been hundreds of people that have, that have done this across the country and across the world. And I'm glad that we're doing it, so it's awesome. So. Um, if, you, if you guys need help with something, there's tons of people here that are willing to watch kids, uh, that are willing to help out and mow your lawn. I know you volunteered last summer to do that for me, but thank you for that, by the way. So, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. So, if you guys wanted to, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to think more of, of the right thing to say, but either way, if you haven't gone to the counter, it's time to go, and God will do incredible things for you. So, thank you, for our church family, for opening your arms to me. And uh, praise God for giving me all that you've worked for me. Thank you again. Thank you, AJ. And <clears throat> what a tremendous blessing it is to, uh, to watch uh, AJ and Christy and their boys and experience uh, God's power and, and his blessing in their lives. Well, we are uh, taking a journey, with, a journey to the cross this season. I uh, hope many of you are... Uh, uh, going through the journey to the cross that uh, we have made available to you. Um, <clears throat> and I, I know it's been a blessing to me. And I was going to say this next week, but I'm going to say it this week. Um, you know, that's the problem when you, when you write a sermon in advance. You get, you get them confused. But I'm going to try not to. But uh, as part of the journey to the cross, the, the devotional books and the guides that we have had, 
I've been spending more time in the scriptures that are, uh, that are between Palm Sunday and Easter uh, than I have for a long time. It's really been a blessing and an encouragement and a, and a strengthening and a, real, and a real challenge as I see what, what uh, Jesus um, endured and experienced as he, was, uh, uh, as he was preparing to lay down his life uh, for us. So I'd encourage you along those lines. They're still out there, some of them. Um, uh, we haven't discounted them yet, but that, and it's not too late. You can go ahead and get started, and they are, uh, they are a great tool uh, to help us. Well, this week's uh, journey to the cross takes us to the Praetorium in Jerusalem. The Praetorium is uh, a common area that was attached to the, um, to the house or to the, to the home of uh, Pontius Pilate. It was kind of a common greeting area, a common uh, uh, meeting area, just kind of an open space. And uh, it, was, it is there that we find ourselves uh, this morning. Now, the Jewish Sanhedrin and Herod and Pontius Pilate had condemned Jesus to death by crucifixion. And if you have seen the Passion of the Christ, uh, you have witnessed uh, this particular segment uh, as of, of preparation and being ready for, for the crucifixion and very, very graphic detail. And I'm going to spare you that this morning. You know, there's, there's little... This sounds like a... I'm not, it's not an oxymoron, but it's uh, somebody that knows English better than I do, you can tell me what it is later. There is little greater injustice... Than mockery. There is little greater injustice than mockery. Mockery cuts to the core of what a person is and what they believe. It says that everything you are doesn't count. In fact, it's worse than worthless. Let's take a look at Matthew 27 this morning, verses 27 through 31. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Picture, if you will, Jesus, battered and beaten already, standing in the middle of an open space with perhaps as many as a hundred, even more soldiers around him. And one by one, as he stands there in a scarlet robe with a, a stick in his hand, with a bunch of weeds on his head, and they come and they say to him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they begin to, they begin to kneel, but then as they stand up, they grab that little stick out of his hand and go, Bop! Hail, King of the Jews! Or they come and they bow down before him. And on their way up, they say, Hail, King of the Jews! And let it fly. Or they say, Hail, King of the Jews! And as they are coming up, they smack him on the head with their fist. mockery. Merriam-Webster.com dictionary defines mockery this way. Insulting or contemptuous action or speech. Derision. A subject of laughter, derision, or sport. A counterfeit appearance, an insincere, contemptible, or impertinent imitation. Through their mocking of Jesus, the, the various levels of authority 
attacked every, everything about him. They attacked his prophetic office. You see, there were three things that Jesus was all wrapped into one. He was a prophet and he was a priest and he was a king. And they attacked his prophetic office when they would smack him on the head and say, prophesy to us, O Christ, who was it that hit you? They attacked his priestly office. When a little later on, as he was hanging on the cross, they would say over and over again, he saved, him, he saved others, but himself he cannot save. In other words, he could, he could heal those who were sick. He could forgive sins, but he can't save himself. They mocked his, king, his, his kingly office when they said to him, Hail, King of the Jews! You know, even the, even the thorns that he wore on his head were a symbol of what he was experiencing. Because even the crown of thorns is reminiscent of the curse that God placed upon Adam and all of us in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, when God uh, escorted uh, uh, Adam and Eve out of the garden, and he said, from now on, you are going to get your livelihood from the toil of, of, the, of, the, of the earth, and it is going to, perf- it is going to produce thorns and, th- and thistles. And so even the crown of thorns was in essence where the sin and the curse of mankind was placed on Jesus. Well, the mocking was only one part of it. Of course, you know, it began, it, it began uh, in only one part of the entire experience that Jesus had in Matthew 26 and 27. His suffering began with his arrest. It proceeded through all of the different trials of the night and continued with the beatings from the religious leaders as well as the, as well as the Roman soldiers. And then to the, the, the climax of it all was they led him away and crucified him. Why did Jesus have to suffer so much? Why do we need a sacrifice anyway? Was there no other way that the problem of sin could be taken care of? Now, now these are honest questions that people ask. Why is it necessary? Why was it necessary? What's it all about? What's the deal? Well, let's begin by taking just a few minutes to, to look to talk about sin. The choice of our first parents, Adam and Eve, to rebel against their Creator's sovereignty over their lives turned paradise into chaos, and it turned life into a struggle and innocence into guilt. And it infected everyone, all who were going to be their offspring, who is everyone. One writer said, Frank Moore said, uh, they they were not only our physical first parents, but they were representing, they were representative parents. And and Frank Moore says, and they represented us very, very badly because of their sin and disobedience. And by them, sin entered into the world and death entered into the world. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, we read these words, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned, for before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam who was a pattern of the one to come. Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. Though we have not committed their sin as a result of their sin, we are are predisposed to behave as they did. We are are spiritually predisposed to uh, turn away from God. We are predisposed we, we, are, we are predisposed to go and live our own life. You see, sin is an all-pervasive per- all um, thing. It affects everything, every part of life. 
And now I'm not just talking about individually, but I'm talking about as humanity. As, as, as the whole human race, sin pervades the whole human race. It severs our relationship with our sovereign, leading us to alienation and spiritual death. One of the things that Adam and Eve experienced right away was that separation from God. They knew in a heartbeat. They knew in a moment. They knew, uh, they knew exactly that something had gone wrong. Have, have you ever had that experience? Have you ever had that experience of something that you have done and all of a sudden you just know that you shouldn't have done it? I mean, I won't say that it's wrong or sinful or anything like that, but you just know in your heart of hearts that, that there's going to be consequences from this thing, whatever it is. And so it is with our relationship with, with, with all mankind's, our relationship with God. We are alienated from Him. We are... We are spiritually dead. Sin also has distorted humanity. It distorts us. It brings guilt. It brings condemnation. It brings corruption. Sin expresses itself in self-centeredness and self-sufficiency. I don't really need God. I really don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I, I am going to live my life on my own, thank you, and, and, and I'm going to do a pretty good job of it, even if I do say so myself. But then the corruption sets in. Not only there is, there is is real guilt, and there's real condemnation when sin is present. It also enslaves us to Satan. It causes a loss of our spiritual freedom. You see, we can't do anything about sin. It's not that we don't necessarily want to. It's not that we that that we w- wouldn't like to. We can't. We cannot do anything about sin. It enslaves us. Now, some aspects of sin are more enslaving than others, such as addictions, such as behaviors that that lead to to death, such as all kinds of dependencies, not only not only chemical but but emotional. We become emotionally dependent on on others uh, to the point where it becomes uh, impossible to break free. But also it corrupts society. Injustice and unrighteousness are because of sin. Injustice and unrighteousness are because of sin. All of the, all of the heinous crimes that we read about and hear about in the news, all of the unbelievable uh, destruct, unbelievably destructive things that we that we encounter and that we experience in our society and our culture, it's because of sin. Well, then let's talk about a little bit about solutions. As I mentioned, we're powerless to do anything about the problem of sin. Romans five six, Paul reminds us that when we were still powerless, he talks about that powerlessness. We cannot do anything about it. Romans 8, 3, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the flesh. Even the law is powerless to do anything really and truly about sin. Romans six twenty three, the Apostle Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. You see, any remedy for sin has to come from somewhere else. The injured party is the one that sets the terms for reconciliation. Take, for example, a husband and wife. One of them, uh, one of them cheats on the other. One of them has an adulterous affair. The one who committed the affair is not the one that establishes the terms of reconciliation. It's the one who has been offended. It's the one who has been harmed. It's the one who's been injured emotionally and spiritually and maybe even physically that sets the terms of the reconciliation. And God's chosen remedy for sin is sacrificial death of an innocent life. God's said, the remedy that I have given you, the remedy that I have given you, there is no remedy other than that. In Leviticus chapter 15, or chapter 17, is where we first 
discover and, and read about kind of that sense of, of uh, that, that sense of uh, atonement or that sense of of, uh, of sacrifice and of life. It's a it's in the middle of of a paragraph where God is through Moses Moses laying down the law and where God is is, is basically saying that that no Israelites no buddy uh, in, in their country is to eat or drink blood or is to eat a, a, an animal where the blood is not drained from it. Because this is what he says. <clears throat> For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any alien uh, living among you eat blood. Now what happened was the priest prayed, in a sense, the sins of the people upon the, uh, upon the animal that was to be sacrificed. It was an innocent animal, had not done anything wrong, but the priest prayed and laid the sins. And so that, that animal bore the sins of the people as it was being sacrificed. Hebrews 9.22 says the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And now that remedy for sin was fully and finally accomplished by the suffering and death of Jesus. That remedy for sin was fully and finally accomplished by, by Jesus. Now the Old Testament uh, system of sacrifices was temporary at best. It was not adequate for what, uh, or they were adequate for what they were intended to do, but they were never intended to fully and completely take away sin. Hebrews chapter, tw chapter 10 says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Day after day, the priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Jesus was not an innocent victim of an angry God. William Greathouse tells the story of a little girl that's talking to her mother. They're talking about maybe it's this time of year. They're talking about Jesus going to the cross and his sacrifice and so on, and, uh, the sacrifice of his life. And she says, you know, Mom, she says, I love Jesus, but I don't like God very well. And sometimes we give that impression. We give that, we give that impression that somehow Jesus is, is, is the only way, the only thing, only one who stands between us and a God who wants to wipe out the human race. No. It was God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together as one. that broke through the barriers that have been erected between us and our God. And it was through God, through Jesus Christ, God incarnate, made atonement for all of humanity's rebellions on the cross. It was Jesus, a very willing participant in our salvation very willing participant in our salvation. Now, while God's wrath and vengeance will, will and does rain down on sin and His vengeance is just and He will repay, in the words of one writer, in the, it is the holy love of God that cut through His wrath and judgment to satisfy His justice and His love. It was the holy love of God I used this quote yesterday at a couple of the Upward Devotions, and I 
<clears throat> sad to say I misquoted it. God, the holy love of God, cut through his wrath and his judgment to satisfy his justice and his love. C.S. Lewis wrote that the central Christian theme is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. Aren't you glad for that fresh start? And you know, sometimes we need more than one fresh start, don't we? Sometimes we come to a point, we come to a, a place in our lives where where in some way or other we have once again come unto a place in a moment of needing Christ's sacrifice for our sins, for our wanderings, for our disobediences, for our you fill in the blank. But somehow, Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. I think that's a good place for a, for a good amen, don't you think? Oh, wow. I know, it's kind of stuffy in here. I'm not sure exactly why, but and I know it's, you know, it's getting drowsy, but let's give this the old college try, shall we? All right, let me, let's try it again. The central Christian theme is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. Isn't that a good place for a good amen? amen? All right. All right. That's good. I knew you were there. You just, you just needed a little prompting, that's all. As we proceed towards the cross, let's continue to be reminded that it is Jesus, that it is his power, it is his death, that gives us life. Would you stand? Oh God, we thank you today for your presence and for your love and for the power of God is at work in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we make this journey to the cross, we make it, Lord, humbly, and uh, hesitantly because Lord there is no way that we can imagine the suffering that you endured all we can do what we can do though is to be grateful and to return to you the love that you have so lavishly poured out on us in Jesus name Amen we're going to sing this closing song. And again, remember that we are going to take just a, whatever you can share this morning, an offering for Howard Willis and helping him out in this time of need. Let's sing. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the prince
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.